the reviewer from the Vancouver Sun said to me, you know, like you are like this the first forty minutes of this film you are very unlikable. <laughs> and you're like it's kinda of gross. I said, Well, addiction is gross. Hi, Kip. Hi, Canada. Hey, we Canada. are here with FirstWeekendClub.ca and Richard Glenn Lett. Hello. Who is the subject, and do I say star, of Never Be Done, the Richard Glenn Lett story. Yeah. I want to just say that it's extremely brave, and I'm extremely moved by your whole journey and the whole experience. And I've known you for a few years now, mm -hmm. and but on the other side of your sobriety journey. Yes, yes. And to me, this, Why are you still this, talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> to me, this film is... Um, just such a gift and such a tool. Yes. You're a comedian revealing such a personal right. journey and such a personal subject matter, and you're a known comedian. You know, I'm not the only one, obviously, in comedy that, that struggles with um, addiction or, you know, or with struggles in recovery. I mean, recovery is a, a, a daily um, task, a grind that you know we, we have to do. I think that we've lost enough of our you know, sweetest and best comedians to addiction that... Um, and artists, it's, artists at large. Absolutely, that it's time for, you know, it to be discussed. Mm -hmm. And so I think the relevancy of a, a story about a journeyman headline club comic mm -hmm. almost uh, losing his life to addiction is um, like achingly relevant. Yeah. to what's going on. I mean... It's so important, Richard. It's just so important. And I know a lot of people that are very grateful for this. I know there wasn't a dry eye in the house at the Whistler Film Festival. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like most good documentaries, the, the documentarian doesn't know where it's going. Mm -hmm. You know, they begin on some mm -hmm. sort of agenda. And then, you know, um, it just ends up being about something entirely different. Mm -hmm. Because the cameras and the narrative is discovered through you know, the, the, the ongoingness of it all. Right. What year did it start? Um, well, you know, it's pretty easy for me to say that because it's also very close to my dry date. Mm -hmm. And when you're in recovery, you cling to your dry date, your yeah. last day of drinking, um, with uh, the same fervor that a drowning man holds on to, you know, a life jacket. So, um, my dry date is December 27th, 2009. Mm -hmm. So uh, Roy began filming this in, um, I would say late September, early October, wow. 2009. And 10 years, he, yo. I know. And, yeah. and then he just kept filming, hitting bottom. You know, like when they talk about hitting bottom, I think that's a pretty accurate description of it. Mm -hmm. You don't, they don't call about, you know, nestling bottom or <laughs> floating to the bottom they talk about no nope, it just did that it. yeah so no yeah. huh. i did that and um so and still you know the terrible thing about addiction is that it is we're oblivious to it part of the disease one of the mm -hmm. symptoms of addiction is that you don't believe you have it you know Very true. so um dana g from the vancouver sun said to me um well, I guess the next step for you would have been death. And I went, wow, really? Oh, wow. You know, you know and, so, and, if, and so, you know, you don't know. You know, when people are dying of addiction all the time, you know, and, and I'm sure that they don't think that this is it for them. So I didn't see that anyway. I can certainly see it now in the film. I've described it as seeing your own ghost. That's, wow. what, that's what it felt like. Watching it was just going like, wow, I'm dead there. Mm -hmm. I'm, this this guy's not going to make it, and um, and then you know to see myself in full blown uh, mm -hmm. mental collapse, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that guy's like, he, he, they're just the the blinding, you know, belief that I had in, in something like that I was going to get my damage deposit back and all this <laughs> stuff, and just going, oh man. So yeah. it was really terrifying to see that, mm -hmm. to see my own ghost, to see that I was, um, you know, that it was that I was that close uh, to the edge of it all, and um, and the other thing too is I don't really remember it. Yeah. At a certain point, my friend Kathleen, who was in the 
uh, film quite a bit, um, and as viewed by a lot of people who see the film as, you know, a bit of a hero, mm -hmm. um, that she stuck by me yeah. and showed up. And she told me that she had prayed for extra angels for me. Said she was so concerned about me that, she, that I needed not just, you know, your average you know, choir of angels, but we just needed to. Bring all the angels. As many as you got. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be needing a lot of angels uh -huh. here. And um, without, you know, getting too weird about it, it, it really felt like, you know, Roy and Graham, the director of photography, were those angels. Um, because they just wouldn't leave me alone. And... Um, and it was a strange phenomena to have that go on, where you are losing everything. I'm, you know, getting kicked out of clubs, and now I can't perform anywhere. And then I'm getting kicked out of my apartment, and I don't know what to do, and all this kind of stuff. And there's these guys that are asking me questions while this is going on. Mm -hmm. So fortunately for me, Roy was there to film it all and play it back for me. So they went, oh, oh, oh. oh. And it's embarrassing, some of the stuff that I said. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, they didn't pull any punches. I am grateful mm. that they uh, that they didn't throw anyone else under the bus in this but me. What does showbiz and comedy mean to you now versus what it meant to you then? Has it changed? And how? Well, yeah, it has changed. I mean, like, you know, when you look at this, the film, uh, some people, old Richard may have thought, well, maybe this film will be the thing that gives me the break, that will get the gig, that will get me the car and the girl and the, you know, the <laughs> relevance and all this other sort of stuff. They were just so obsessed. I mean, the, the show that I toured with dealt with stand-up comedy as an addiction. So um, now I view my ability to make people laugh or my ability to be brave and, you know, self-disclosing um, is really about uh, um, how I can be of service. This is how we stay sober. You know, they, they, they've learned again and again and again that the way that people who struggle with addictions manage to um, stay sober mm -hmm. or stay clean or stay whatever, you know, not using and drinking is by helping other people. Mm -hmm. In fact, we know that about all sorts of people, that, that there's, that's why we have nurses and doctors and teachers and you know documentarians, is because we know that people are happiest when they're helping. So now you know? showbiz is about service to you and comedy is about service rather than a self-indulgent mm -hmm. I mean, ego I, trip fantasy of some kind or whatever it was. Yeah, because the, 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 are, are grasping for something. I think a lot of artists go through that, just grasping for for something. But it, it is a sense of um, wanting recognition, wanting acceptance, maybe, and it, and sure. it causes. Well, well, there'll never be enough, Justine. There <laughs> never, ever, ever will be enough. You know, some of you know. I mean, some of the people that I, I mean, it's very interesting. The two most famous people that I spent any time with, uh, Dave Chappelle and Robin Williams, right, mm -hmm. and. We lost Robin, mm -hmm. and we lost Robin to addiction. That there was never, it was just never going to be enough. Meanwhile, Dave Chappelle, same thing. They offer him fifty million dollars, and he goes, "You people are trying to kill me." And he jetted. He went to Africa. He disappeared. Right huh. now, if if Robin had had huh. a sponsor instead of a manager. Mm -hmm. Who would have said to him, you know, Mrs. Doubtfire 2? Are you kidding me? <laughs> we didn't need Mrs. Doubtfire 1. I love that movie. <laughs> sure. But it's not worth your life. It's right? not worth, no, never now, is a movie worth so, anyone's life. Right, so Dave, yeah. and so Dave Chappelle gets to hang out with his kid. He talks about how his kid borrows money so that he can buy tickets for other comedian shows, mm. right? So, I mean, mm -hmm, Dave's, mm -hmm. a, Dave's real, right? And so, and both of them were addicts. Both of them are addicts, right? One of them we lost, one of them we di didn't lose, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I just want to be on the Dave Chappelle side of things, which yeah. is sometimes, you know, the, 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 the people want more of you than you can reasonably give. Mm -hmm. And you have to say no. Yeah, um, I've seen that up close too, it's very strange. 
Absolutely. So, mm-hmm. and and it's a very lonely place. But my my big wish for the film is that it is something that people can watch in recovery centers or treatment centers, um, or you know that it might be able to help people. I know already there's been testimonials by various people that um, who are either dealing with you know personally with addiction or dealing with people that they love that have. Um, addiction yeah. issues. It's a, it's a really... It's rampant. It's simply rampant. We all know somebody very close to us or, you know, one degree removed. Sure, and it's nasty because it manifests in such a, you know, like, coarse and gross way. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the, the, the reviewer from the Vancouver Sun said to me, you know, like, you are, like, this, the first 40 minutes of this film, you are very unlikable. <laughs> and you're, like, it's kind of gross. I said, well... Addiction is gross, yeah. and um, you know, and that's the, I think what's really useful about the film is that that once you can see you know who I am without drinking and drugs, without that that pain and that mental illness, you go well. This person was worth saving. Yeah. So many times we get to people that are so far gone that we go like maybe it's just best that we just let that one go, mm-hmm. and that's sort of the way I felt about myself that maybe you know I should just let this one go. But there is a, a force that makes us, you know, come together and try and help each other. Yeah. And however you want to describe that force, that, you know, higher power, God, or whatever it is that's outside of yourself that, that lets you know that, that you're loved and worth, you know, making that, that battle for. And, you know, things turn on a dime. In the film, there's a very powerful visual. These guys did a great job because film is a visual medium. And at one point, I'm raging. I can't. I've got a carport full of stuff. I've, you know, said some terrible things, and I storm out of there and I stamp on this cord, and the door opens up. The garage door opens mm-hmm. up, and I walk into the light. Yeah. And that light is either the end or the beginning, right? Rebirth or death. And every addict has those moments, and we just want to try as much as possible to let it be rebirth. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's those guys, you know, those guys with those cameras, those mm-hmm. people, you know, making coffee, that get, you know, showing up at, mm-hmm. at treatment centers, people that study counseling, that people that, you know, the one little sister that goes and talks to her brother when the whole family is done with him. You know, there's always one person that goes, well, I'm, I'm going to go and see him. And, and, you know, and even if we lose, and we lose a lot to it, even if we do, it's worth trying. It certainly is. Yeah. Anyway, so... How well, beautiful. How powerful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I want to ask you one more question. Yes. <laughs> what advice would you give to um, people maybe just beginning their journey in recovery? What would you... Do you have any advice? Do you have any words of support of well, an offering? There's two statements that I get people that are struggling and very early in recovery, and I get them to say it and memorize it. Mm. And one of them is, everything is okay, mm. right? And that means, you know, like, look around, because so much of what's going on is in our head. Everything is okay, right? And that, that means, you know, be grateful. For what is right, not what we think we should have been. Not what mm-hmm. we, should, you know, so we're so determined by our, our careers or our relationships or whatever. It's just to go, everything is okay. And the other is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Have some faith. Wow. Right. And if you can, you know, like fear is is an illusion. Mm-hmm. It's just our ego trying to mess with us. Just don't be afraid. The most common phrase in the Bible is fear not. Right, every spiritual teacher has said the same thing. Don't be afraid. Everything is okay, dude, everything's okay. You're, what, what imminent danger, I say to these guys, what imminent danger are you in right now? Besides me spilling my coffee on you, <laughs> that's about it, right? So everything's okay, nice. right? Yeah. And don't be afraid, right? You don't need to be afraid that, mm-hmm. that, that, that there is hope for us all. And if, if the film inspires hope for people, then then, it, then, it's, then it's worth it. You know, one life saved changes the world. 
It certainly does. Anyway. High five, yo. High five. That All right, lyrics. and let's try again. That's now, and, never be done. The Richard Glenn Lett story. We can't wait to share it with you right. all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank First you. First weekend club. <laughs> Dot ca. <laughs> <laughs>